Hello, all you beautiful people. Hi. <laughs> you should know something about my preaching philosophy before we begin. It's simple. Nate, no one's listening to you. <laughs> I mean it. I'm totally serious. My sermons are not designed to be heard. They are invitations to listen to that which is within and beyond. Let us begin. My parents had a vision to transform 40 acres of desert in northern Nevada into a lush alfalfa farm. They could not do it alone, so they solicited all the help that they could get, including me, their eldest son. I was eight years old when driving a beat-up Ford while my dad stood in the bed of the pickup and threw fence posts into the drought-stricken sand. We cultivated the soil and constructed huge pipes on wheels to spread the water from one side of the farm to the next and back again. Eventually, the dream came true. The 40 acres of desert was transformed into a lush sea of green. I was taught early that it is possible to reap what you sow, a metaphor used by many, many sacred texts. Although my folks were not religious, they were devotional. Every Sunday we went horseback riding in the Sierra Nevadas. I never explicitly asked them, but always suspected that they were the founders of the equestrian religion. <laughs> After setting up camp, we would sit around a campfire and tell stories. My mom and brother would pull out their guitars and we'd sing songs. My dad would recite poetry and we'd sit in silence and we'd make wishes on falling stars. Surrounded by the beauty of Lake Tahoe, the material, the tangible, the natural, became a catalyst for our reflections on the non-material aspects of life. But there came a time when not even nature could address social questions. At the age of 15, my dad found a love letter in my pants pocket addressed to my boyfriend. It was 1991. I had started my first year of high school where my classmates were preoccupied with a rodeo and where their trucks were armed with gun racks. In response to my coming out, my grandmother grabbed my hand and said, I hear there's a lesbian up at the Unitarian Fellowship. <laughs> yeah. And so off we went to meet the lesbian. But I have a confession to make. I don't actually remember meeting the lesbian. <laughs> but what I do remember is that this little fellowship of a dozen people met in a trailer in Reno, Nevada. Having built a new sanctuary next to that same trailer, the UU Fellowship of Northern Nevada is now over 200 members strong. That deserves some love. I'm so proud of it. I found something remarkable that day. Community. It was a community of people who renounced fanaticism. They proclaimed reason. They promoted religious freedom and cultivated humanity. I am aware that this small gaggle of UUs and a lesbian, <laughs> <laughs> they developed content. They used different content from stuff that was provided by the church of the larger fellowship. I remember my first experience was saying, what's a church in a box? And we'd open up the materials and a man would read. And it was so simple. We would reflect upon our lives and sing songs and, and just be together. It was in that moment that something remarkable happened. These simple exchanges of humanity those simple exchanges created wonder. And I wonder if this small group of people felt like they were planting seeds in a drought-stricken land. 
Little did they know what they would reap, how the very act of planting this fellowship saved my life. Literally. In my nightstand laid a knife, a note, and a calendar. I was counting down the days with the intent to take my own life. Unbeknownst to my grandmother, there were only two days left to the countdown before that fateful Sunday morning. A small group gathered and provided me an oasis from the desert of despair. I was hungry for belonging, and they fed me hospitality. I was thirsty for self-worth, and they offered me a cup of acceptance. I was a stranger, and they welcomed me. And together, we knew freedom. In this point in time, the Church of the Larger Fellowship was aware that printed material was the most efficient way to disseminate the saving message of Unitarian Universalism. The founders of this local fellowship knew that the most accessible place to advertise their location was in a, you might remember this, a phone book. (laughs) So my grandmother, she used the yellow pages to find the address. She then gave me a folded map, and we drove nearly an hour to gather in fellowship. Today, the CLF is exploring innovative methods to serve dispersed people throughout the globe. Think for a moment the kinds of tools we now have at our disposal to achieve this goal. But looking back on how technology has changed in the last ten years, imagine what might come in the next ten years. As a rookie minister in the age of technology... It's only right for me to acknowledge the speed by which our world has changed. When I was eight, the neighboring farms all shared one single party line, and therefore the technological training that I had consisted of mastering the art of lifting the receiver without anyone noticing I was eavesdropping. (laughs) Yeah. I am a part of that last generation who learned how to type on a typewriter. The last generation who had handwritten pen pals. The last generation that listened to records, A-tracks and tapes, who rented movies from stores, (laughs) watched them on VCRs. The last generation to write checks. Today, eight-year-olds are learning to read and type by sending text messages. They have video pals from across the world and use translating software to communicate. They eavesdrop by leaving their eye touch on record while they leave the room giggling. (laughs) Today, we are trained to download music and movies to instantly get everything we want to swipe cards rather than exchange green paper. When we want to find directions, we use our phones to show us the most efficient route based on a global positioning system, and when we do arrive, we broadcast it to the world. (laughs) Our world is changing, and change is inevitable. But what else is change? Could it be an invitation for us to transform? I'm reminded of the words of Houston Smith, a scholar of comparative religions, who said, the century's technological advances must be matched by comparable advances in human relations. This is the primary question that CLF is now poised to ask. How will we use technology to cultivate humanity? How will we use the tools of our time to be the religion of our time? How will we reach those wandering in the deserts of despair? How will we overcome the boundaries of time and place to achieve things that we could not do otherwise? 
Take, for instance, a love story. The story of a bride and groom whose mothers were ill and unable to attend their wedding. This couple, gathered with a few friends in the historic chapel of the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, and with a laptop, we Skyped in one mother from the Ukraine, the other from Los Angeles, and from across the wall of the world, each mother witnessed the wedding from their hospital bed. After the ceremony, we cuddled around the laptop screens to take a photo of the uniting families. <laughs> Thanks to technology, we were able to achieve something that would not otherwise have been possible. And so, members of the great church of the larger fellowship, the quest has begun. What stakes will you make? What stakes will you claim how will you collectively master these two goals? The art of being a religion of our time and the art of being human. Keep using technology effectively, but always remember that it's not about the gadgets. It's about connecting. It's about connecting opportunities. It's about connecting creating opportunities for intimacy, for cultivating humanity. In an age of technological advancements, there must be, there must be comparable advances in human relations. And all we got to do is create a safe place, whether real or virtual, where people can gather to be known, to know that they matter, to know that they belong. It will take a simple invitation to gather and something, something magical will happen. When gathering, our living tradition will teach them how to, as Maya Angelou says, scribe their worth into the image of their most private need and sculpt their dignity into the image of their most public selves. They will do this when they gather in trailers, at kitchen tables, in internet cafes and prison cells. They will do this whether they are online or off to serve our country. And so let us never forget that no matter how fast technology may evolve, one thing will always remain constant. People will gather. They will gather time and time again to celebrate, to mourn, to tell stories, to sing songs, to sit in silence and make meaning of their lives. And so, dear members of the fantastic Church of the Larger Fellowship, continue to serve dispersed people throughout the globe. Continue to create ways to gather where there is no such opportunity. Continue to use technology to cultivate humanity. And may... We all know that you are the right person at the right time to achieve these goals. We are so proud you are our minister. You know that it's not about the gadgets. It's all about connection, the human connection. It's about being a religion of our time for the people of our time. And just you wait, because people, people will come. Because soon enough, some grandmother from some remote corner of the world is going to come to you and ask, are you the lesbian of the larger fellowship? Are you? <laughs> yep. Soon enough. And in that remarkable moment, <laughs> you're going to realize something important. That the grandmother is not alone. At her side is a child. That child has long since mastered the art of despair. And then that's when you will reach out, you'll kindle a flame, and tell some stories. You'll sit in silence and make a thousand wishes into the sunrise. 
And together, you will look out into the landscape of that once drought-stricken desert and bask in abundance. And together, you will know freedom. Blessings on your ministry and blessings on your ministry together. Amen. Thank you.